Welcome to Fringe Pop 321. I'm Christopher Niles. This is Dr. Aaron Judkins. And um, I just uh, was listening to uh, Aaron speak on um, Gobekli Tepe, a lot of his most recent findings with ancient uh, languages there, or p potentially ancient languages being uh, uncovered there. Um, I was in very intrigued by his last book, Guardians of uh, Gobekli Tepe. And uh, what I wanted to do is just have a discussion because you keep tossing out some incredible facts in history mm. that really goes back to, you know, Noah's flood. It goes back to the Tower of Babel. It goes back yeah. to this ice age, you know, things that mesh with um, a version of secular history. Uh, including the drier young, uh, the younger uh, dry younger dry event. event, and yes. um, so I just wanted you. Yeah. Would you just take me through it because right. I find it fascinating, and we have you here as an expert, and you've dug into this stuff for so many years. And when I get it in pieces, and it's connected to you know excavations and pillars and and, <laughs> and enclosure numbers. Yeah. No, let's just do a flow. So would you just take me through a flow of, of yeah. a biblical timeline from what you have now uncovered in connection with um, Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe, Tepe and yeah. on? Yeah, so this, you know, Gobekli Tepe, what is Gobekli Tepe? It's, a, it's an archaeological site in southeastern Turkey. Um, it's Turkish, which means um, potbelly hill or a navel hill. Hmm. Another way you can think of it is a pregnant hill. So a tepe is a hill, Gobekli Tepe is a pregnant hill or a potbelly hill, literally. Uh, so uh, a man that follows my work um, named Roger about five years ago uh, contacted me and he said, uh, would, do, you, do you know what Gobekli, Gobekli Tepe is? And, and I said, uh, I've, I've heard of it. And he said, um, you know, he encouraged me to look into it and I said, I just, you know, I don't have t I don't have time to look into to this, and and so over the course of several months, I I, I basically I, I I said no about three times. I just don't have time to look into it. I've heard about it. I heard about the two central pillars. That's all I knew about it. And um, so finally, he said, Aaron, you got to take another look at this. And I so so I thought, well, I came up with the theory. I thought, well, I thought, you know, this, you know, it's it's within the region of Ararat. It's about 500 miles away or something, but it's it's you know in the proximity maybe this has something to do with with you know a, a memorial to Noah's flood or something. There was animals on the stones, and someone asked me you know uh, on one of the pillars it, it, you know they're anthropomorphic images, and one of them has this belt. And he said he said look at this, it's wearing a belt. I said that that's not a belt. I mean it can't be a belt, and so I just dismissed it. I said, that's not, that's not a belt. It just looks, it looks that way, but it's not. Well, when I went back to actually start looking into this, I realized I was wrong. That is a belt. And these are anthropomorphic images. And so as I began to dig into this uh, in the research of it, um, what I learned uh, totally blew my mind, really. It, it, it changed my perspective about Gobekli Tepe altogether. And, um, you know, I, I had to... Um, you know, I had to change my views on some things. Why? Uh, well, because the, of the of the of the implications, the evidence was was showing us something very clearly. Um, but I didn't quite know. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. And um, well, when I watch ancient civilization shows, Gobekli Tepe, you know, they always oh, it's this twelve thousand year old civilization. Are you are you speaking to what you discovered that maybe it's more modern? Yeah, when you say, uh, I, I, what do you mean? But why is it yeah. so impactful for you? Yeah. So the the you know these these images on these stones uh, suddenly stood out to me one 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 day when I was doing this research and and I saw these images on on what would be the neck area of these uh, T column stones structures. The the T's are turned this way though. They're anthropomorphic, which means that they're human-like. They don't have any face, but they do have arms. They wrap it around to the navel. They are wearing a belt, and they're wearing a fox pelt loincloth, which is interesting. You can't really identify the sexes, but, um, but there's something happening there. One of the uh, pillars has an image of a bull on it, right about in the neck area. 
the other pillar has an image of, uh, of, a, of, a, of, a, of the full moon and a crescent moon. Now, um, what's interesting is, is the implications of that in that area of, uh, it's, this is near ancient Haran on, on, on the Fertile Crescent. And uh, back in Abraham's time, even before Abraham, his father Terah, they worshiped the moon god. Uh, we see this in the region, that they are, have deified the moon god. Uh, we see it in ancient Jericho, uh, which dates back to the Neolithic times. They are worshiping the moon god. Why? Because they had deified it. Jeremiah warns us about this. Is, um, you have uh, said to a stone, you're my father. You know, uh, this, is, this is totally against what, um, you know, any kind of idol worship. That's why God was very clear with the ancient Israelites. Do not make any graven images out of stone or out of wood. Why? Because they were being called out of Egypt. This is under all kinds of gods that were in images, it's this imagery. So we see this imagery, this imagery going back to Gobekli like Tepe. So the implications are, why are these images there? And these art motifs, are they art motifs? And uh, so that, that, that kind of led me on this journey about this, where do you put Gobekli Tepe uh, on a biblical timeline? Where would, I, where would I put it? How does it fit in? Uh, because we know it's built on a limestone outcrop. Limestone's only formed, it's sedimentary rock, it's only formed underwater. And so from a biblical point of view, this is post-flood because this is, this is sedimentary limestone rock. Um, so does that mean they're not Neolithic? Well, the Neolithic is an age that a secular timeline puts on it. See, okay. um, the, the biblical times doesn't name it Neolithic. Neolithic just simply means Stone Age. Um, but if we see it from a biblical perspective. Post-flood in a biblical Post-flood, so what happens is that they're coming out of the flood uh, and they get culturally reset. Why? Because they're having to start over. It's eight people. They just, everything's been wiped out. They're having to start over. So culture, uh, the humanity is coming out of this Noahic deluge and they're trying to rebuild. And then about 500 years or so after the flood. Okay, but in your timeline, in give, me, give me a timeline for the Noahic flood. Well, it depends on what timeline you wanna, what want you wanna use. So the time, well, th my timeline is based on on, on the biblical timeline. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's two different timelines that you can use, and I actually detail this in the book. Um, the first timeline is the Masoretic timeline, okay. uh, which is uh, 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 a time frame that, um, that most uh, people use. It's, it's, uh, it's th this is what the King James mm -hmm. Bible is based on, the Masoretic text, uh, which is the authorized version. And then there's the Septuagint timeline. And so when I got to looking at the timelines, uh, I realized that there's, you know, there there was a, there was a problem in the Masoretic timeline trying to insert the Ice Age, because there's no room for a 700-year Ice Age or a 1,000-year Ice Age on the Masoretic timeline. Right after the uh, after the, you got about a hundred years between the flood and the Tower of Babel. Gotcha. And so some, some scholars will say, well, that's enough room or enough time to build up a generation uh, for the Tower of Babel. I don't think it's enough time. A hundred years is not that much time to build, to have enough people uh, for this type of event. However, on the Septuagint timeline, you do have room. You have room, a full room, 500 years, 700 years, it okay. gives you an extra 1,400 plus years on that timeline alone, which is plenty of room to insert the Ice Age. Ice age okay. So now you have the Ice Age event that coincides with the Younger Dryas that you mentioned earlier. Okay, so let's take a step back for all of us and let's just do this. Let's go Noahic Flood, Ice Age, Babel, Younger Dryas, just for the lay person here, yeah. just lay that out for me. Yeah. and a flow, because I find it fascinating, including fossil evidence for kind of a flash freeze event for yeah. these creatures that I grew up with in school, you know, the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger. Take mm -hmm. me through that. Yeah, so we see God's creation, you know, uh, including humans going through the flood, but, you know, these uh, creatures are saved on the ark. 
two of the uh, unclean, but seven of the cleans. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, they're coming out of the, this great deluge on the earth. Um, and then uh, we have this Ice Age event that hits them. And the Ice Age really sets them back. Uh, it forces them to migrate. Uh, but then you have the Tower of Babel. So it depends Stop. on... Give me a little more reason of why we have an Ice Age post deluge. Yeah, the, so the Ice Age is, the mechanism for an Ice Age is the flood. Uh, because why? Because you have um, you have it, it, it's all based on water mechanism, and so um, in uh, the we can measure the Earth's magnetic field. We know that there's been a magnetic field reversal, and so when this magnetic field happens, so they recorded it in tree rings in, in New Zealand. I mean, this is all in published studies, um, but we see that this sudden change in magnetic field precipitated by the uh, Noahic Deluge, brought on the Ice Age about 500 years, according to Michael Ord's model, about 500 years after the flood. Okay. And because of this, it, 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 the, the precipitation that's falling in the northern latitudes comes down as ice and snow. In the lower latitudes, it rains. So, yes, there is the flood, but there's also other things happening. We have meteor strikes, we have um, we have the Younger Dryas event. Temperatures are dropping globally at least by 30 degrees. Uh, the, the world's oceans um, during this time period drop between 200 and 400 feet. It forces migration of people. People are scattering. So when the Tower of Babel happens, it's a confounding of the languages. But the Ice Age hits them and it forces them to, to disperse. Because of that, you don't have the animals and the greenery and this, this fertile crescent anymore is not fertile. Th this is an abandonment of uh, even water issues. They, they are having to move to, to survive. And so you go with the people that you can, that can, you can speak with and they can understand you. Um, but this, this whole thing changes again in the Younger Dry event. So the Ice Age animals come into this because we see mammals, mastodons, um, dire wolves, saber-toothed tigers, three-toed horses, camels, all being buried together. Those giant very sloths. Giant sloths. Favorite. Yeah, all together. You know, in um, um, you know, there's a site in Colorado that these site these animals are all buried together at over 8,000 feet in elevation in Colorado. Uh, why and how? We, we have another site in Waco, Texas, called the the Sudden Death Site, the the Mammoth Waco Sudden Death Site. And these are mammoths that have been suddenly buried. Uh, we see one adult mammoth that is raising up a juvenile mammoth on its tusk as they were being buried, trying to trying keep to it up it. out of the mud. Wow. And they're buried in with camels, three-toed horses, saber tooths things like this. Mm -hmm. So uh, we see a record of a, what, they, what, what geologists call a Pleistocene extinction event. So these animals get wiped out. Why? Because the ecology of the earth is changing again. And so we, we see this all around the earth. Dramatically very, quick. very, Very dramatically. I mean, in the northern latitudes, uh, in Siberia, these mammoths are flash frozen. Uh, we see temperatures of like minus 175 degrees Fahrenheit. They're instantly frozen. But that environment was not a tro it was not a, a, a frozen wasteland like it is now. It was a tropical environment, and we know that because the evidence of the fresh vegetation that they ate, the bacteria and things that are still in their stomach, uh, they're not fossilized. They're they're mummified, really. And so that these ice age animals, the mammoths, the mastodons, all these animals that we talked about, were suddenly wiped out, and this is a result of the flood. So we have the flood, then we have the Ice Age happening. The Ice Age uh, lasts anywhere between 500 years to 1,000 years. Probably a rough estimate is maybe 700 years. So 700 years of time, or 1,000 years, uh, which is exactly what the Younger, Mi uh, the younger Dryas model predicts. And explain, uh, uh, you, you, Younger Dryas, for those of us who yeah, so um, the Younger Dryas event is, is basically just a, a, a terminology uh, that, the, that the planet uh, temperatures dropped, the ocean levels 
dropped um, and, and this extinction event happened in the Pleistocene. This is all the animals that we talked about. Okay. In, in Clovis, New Mexico, there's, there's, uh, there's an archeological dead zone. We see evidence of habitation, then all of a sudden we don't see anything. And it's just like, where do they go? This is because this was a global event. This happened, this impacted everybody on, right. on planet Earth. So, and I've always heard of the Younger Dryas as including like a meteor strikes, lots of, well, there's, there's, is there's that part, just part yeah, of it? Yeah, there's, there's not only uh, meteor strikes that's happening, there, there's catastrophes. Uh, you know, there's, there's you know, some 10,000 volcanoes, gotcha. you know, exploding all over the earth. Because you, you know, have the magnetic ring of fire, shift, we have, you have, you have, uh, you know, the, the fountains of the deep, you have volcanic yes. eruptions, you have meteor strikes, you have very, ca the catastrophism on a, on a massive scale. Yeah, and, so and could that catastrophism create everything that we see in the uh, the different layers currently? The different, uh, you know, the the, you know, I mean, it's very hard for me to reconcile when I go through some of these canyons, or you know, you you go to Grand yeah, Canyon. I get, yeah. you know, I've I've studied like Mount St. Helens and what happens mm. so quickly in a one day event, and yeah. yet you and and. The, the fossil record where you have all these different strata, all these different layers, but you have a tree that's going up through 10 layers, or you have a, a an ancient whale skeleton through eight layers. And it's like, yeah, well, how did they yeah. go, and how did the tree get upside down, you know, yeah. in the fossil? Why is the root ball at the top, yeah, right? Yeah. Is that a result of what we're, is that well, what happened here? Those, that's a result of Noah's flood. Okay. And so we see, you know, these, these, um, these mega sequences coming in and and so the flood has happened. We 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 have this this thought process of it, it just all happens at once. It happens over a course of time. But these mega sequence events happens in stages. So we have these these events that are burying the they are burying the marine life first. So this is why we get fossilization in in ocean creatures, mm -hmm. fish. They're in they're in life action. Fish eating other fish, giving birth. Um, uh, we find them in the death pose, and they're arched backwards. We even see dinosaurs in the death pose. Uh, they have all, I've excavated uh, parts of 15 different dinosaurs, and uh, they've all uh, died in a catastrophic burial due to water. Hmm. And so in some cases, we see that they're still in a death pose. They're arched backwards because they're being asphyxiated. So this is all a result of Noah's flood and the layering event that happens is because of Noah's flood. The fountains of the great deep bursting forth, jettisoning water 200 miles up in the stratosphere. Now it rains from, from below, but from above. And so we see this flooding of the earth happening. But because of all this, we have the fossil record, the geological record, which is a record of stasis. That, that, that geology that we see is not over millions of years of time. There's an explosion of life in the Cambrian at the very bottom, and then it's a record of stasis, which means it is a record of death from, from, from after the Cambrian up, all the way up to the, to the top. This is, this is, these fossils are, are still, you know, a, a, a fossil scorpion in the fossil records is still a scorpion today. There's no change in morphology. Uh, we, we see a fossil bat, it's still a bat. So the same creatures, matter of fact, we see living, what they call living fossils, that are still alive today that they thought were extinct from back in the Jurassic, 65 million years ago. Uh, a great uh, example a, a is crocodile this. crocodile or something? A, a great example. Well, it's a coelacanth fish. Okay. The coelacanth that they used as an, uh, 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 this, this evolutionary link that this fish grew legs and crawled up on land and became a mammal. Yet, fishermen off the coast of South Africa in the yeah. 1950s caught one in their nets. Right, right, right. But they threw it back. So the scientists said, if you ever catch another one, we need to, we need to know. It was like something 20 years later, yeah. they caught a live one. And what's interesting is that a team of National Geographic divers actually sent divers down like 1,000, 1,500 foot. And this is where these fish live. Guess what? They're still a silicant. Yeah. There's no change yet they are alive. What they thought was extinct is still alive, and there's no change in morphology. The way they look prehistoric, and they're huge, but they, 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 they swim vertically, because they feed like this, so they have these fins that help stabilize them as they, as they, as they swim. So this is all part of what we see um, in the fossil record in geology, Noah's flood, and the Ice Age. 
So we're going to need to wrap this one up, but this stuff is so exciting to me, and we yeah. got to unpack it over many other discussions and many other presentations. And if anything, this is just a great way to re-energize, re-excite this platform. Yeah. And what I, but I, I just, um, again, just from a very simple perspective of just this current or this recent history from Noah's flood through this ice age, through this dr younger drier event, this, this the catastrophism, this, mm -hmm. this, you know, when I look at fish that die, what do they do? They, they fall to the bottom of the ocean, they get eaten, they fall apart, they decompose. Why do we have all these flash frozen, in a sense, fish in the fossil record? That doesn't make any sense in what we see, to, unless you had this incredible layering event, this incredible event that laid down um, yeah. You know, uh, mud and and debris and That's and, right. and um, Noah's flood. so so you have these events and and it's just such an exciting time to use our our technological tools and our critical thinking and a little bit different observational you know perspective <laughs> and um, and you know test all these things and try them mm -hmm. and uh, so anyway I just to get excited I know we need to wrap this one up again. I'm here with Dr. Um, um, Aaron Judkins, and uh, this stuff excites me so much. I just want to just feed on this kind of expert uh, experience and the excavations and the, and going into these the fossil record himself. This is Fringe Pop 321. We will unpack it again next time.